There have been boatyards along the harbours and inlets of the south coast for around 400 years. They built boats for war and boats for commerce. Sloops and ketches and brigs carried wool and leather and wine, biscuits, fruit and clay pipes. Boats went out to fight and to fish. Today the boats are mainly for people. Boating for leisure has exploded into a boom industry. The amount of money turned over each year in the pleasure boating business along the south coast has multiplied four times over the past 15 years and is now reckoned at around 50 million pounds. Even with adjustment for inflation, that's a lot of money and it represents a lot of boats. The people in the boats move over the water in an astonishing variety of ways, taking their pleasures singly or in droves. Whether you want a sleek hull and a thundering diesel, or whether you believe that small is beautiful, there's someone somewhere along the southern coastline to supply your need. Curlew is a 32-foot cruising boat, a world cruiser which will take you comfortably to Australia or safely through an Atlantic storm. If you have her built entirely of timber, she'll cost you around £70,000. The glass fibre version is down to £40,000. Either way, few people will rush out on the impulse to buy one. It goes without saying that you have to have the money. You also have to have the disease. There are a number of hoary old sayings which succinctly sum up that particular madness which is yachting. One describes any boat as a hole in the water surrounded by wood into which you pour money. Uh, another likens the sport of sailing to standing under a cold shower tearing up ten pound notes. There are other comparisons which are frankly unprintable. But whichever way you look at it, sailing is a bug and along the south coast here anyway it certainly seems to be one which is more and more catching as a visit to any boat show or our beaches on a summer weekend will certainly testify the curlew class was created in 1980 by a single-minded perfectionist from christchurch in dorset named Hugh Rossiter. Leisure boats not only have to float, they have to look good while they're doing so. The customer looks at the boat on the water, the designer looks at it on the drawing board. What he puts down there in two dimensions must translate into three without losing the graceful line and the elegant proportions. Curlew's immediate predecessor was Pintail. She was shorter than Curlew at 27 and a half feet, a stocky, tough little boat which gave a slightly rougher ride, with less room and amenities for those who sailed in her. Hugh Rossiter is still fond of Pintail, but he relishes Curlew's greater scope. Oh, she's uh, a nice sailing boat. Behaves really very well as a cruising boat. Better than I expected. The, the difference is more than just the difference in size between the two boats. It's you, a, be a better shape. Better shape than the mm, Pintail. Mm, mm. Why is that so? The helm balance is better, which you know, in a three or four hour watch, that makes an awful lot of difference to how tired you're getting. But of course you were absolutely satisfied with the Pinto, weren't you, when she first came off the stocks and yes, stood yes, there on the slip? Yes, well, yes, yes, but one moves on. Yes. For this sort of boat, she must look nice. Uh, if that means a sacrifice of a quarter of a knot, I don't think that worries our potential customers at all. They're, they're pleasing people and uh, mostly they wait for the weather they want before they go on on a passage across the channel or something like that. How does she go in a, in a say, a fairly stiff way? Oh, she goes nicely, yeah. Now what are you doing? You're doing a few knots, aren't you? Yes. Seven. Yeah, are you? Yeah, she's going. Customers say that they want better accommodation, they want a double bed, they want a chart table they can sit at, they want a loo that is completely separate from the rest of the boat. And so it leads on to a bigger boat. Not the same, but similar to the last one. Bigger and better? Better if possible. I mean,
bigger means better, but you like to get it better again. Not just the size difference, you like to get it better again. How much is there uh, an urge to create for the sake of creating, and how much is there an urge to get money in the bank? Oh, it's mostly an urge to create, I think. It is? Yes. Oh, yes. Yes, I... For the business to survive, you've got to produce a new boat every so often, and that's where the money in the bank comes in. But, uh, no, it's the urge to create that, that drives you on. Mm. How do you know that um, what you've created on the flat is going to look good and right in 3D? That's something that you, you just learn from experience. You gradually absorb what, what makes an, a nice shape from the flat into, the, into 3D. When you suddenly come to the moment of having to design a, a new boat, how much is it a total commitment? Oh, it's the, the lines plan that we have here is total concentration. I have to go home for two, three weeks to do that. I can't have to answer the telephone and see about invoices or anything to do with the business. It's, it's the design that has to fill my mind uh, for th about three weeks. Wherever boat builders are gathered together, there'll be men hammering nails into wood, even with glass fibre boats. Now, Hugh, we're standing in what I suppose is uh, the beginnings of the boat, is it? Not really. This is the framework for the plug. And we clad this and plank it and finish it to a very high finish. And then the mould from which we take a fiberglass hull is built around this plug so that it, it follows the shape exactly of the boat. And this is station number eight that's just come yes, in here, I suppose. That, that's one of the stations we saw on the body plan, on the, on the lines plan. Well, Hugh, you've, uh, you've built up this framework. Now, how on earth do you fill all this space with fiberglass? We cover it with timber. Yeah. We finish it to a very high finish and a great accuracy. And from there, we put layers of fiberglass and make a mold. And using fiberglass again, we make a hull out of that mold. Into that mold went nearly one and a half tons of glass fiber. And the boat is born. Here she is, even in her rough state, already looking sleek and elegant. But there's still a lot to be done. The hull arrives from the moulders with the deck in place. Before this hollow shell can be fitted out with bulkheads, lockers, bunks, tables and all the rest of the woodwork, that deck has to come off again. Installing the wood will bring this boat to life. While the deck is off, the craftsman will move in to fit the top straight, the lighting conduit, the deck head liner, and the cockpit joinery. And into the empty hull will go more wood. One of the charms of the glass fiber curlew is the amount of wood on board. Aphromosia outside, African mahogany within. What we're doing here is putting in prefabricated stiffening which will stiffen the hull where the keel is and this forms the ground for the, the bunk the starboard bunk goes there yeah and that's the forward end of the galley the main part of the galley is back there and all, all this has to be bonded to the hull we put glass fiber and resin down here all the way around and that forms part of the structure together with the ground for the joinery. So it really is very important to have this stiffening low down in the boat, is it? Very, yes. Why yeah. is that? I mean, doesn't, well, doesn't the, uh, the fiberglass, doesn't that hold it well enough? That, no, it doesn't quite. It, it's pretty stiff, but you get terrific strains where the keel is. It, it's trying to swing from side to side. And this, this stiffening is most important. Much of this work is done by craftsmen, some by apprentices in their care. Hugh Rossiter aims to take on one new apprentice each year, 
And in this way, he and many other yards along the coast ensures that the essential skills are handed on. Craft is a word too easily misused. In these days of glass fibre, there are those who think it has a very small part to play. The boat would sail, however plain the fittings. But how satisfying to sail with such elegance. Hundred and forty miles eastward, where Sussex meets Kent, you breathe a different air. There's an old world, timeless atmosphere about this yard. Some of these craft you might feel haven't moved much recently and may not move for some time to come. This place was a fishing village before the Romans came. They built boats here for fishing and for war. But five hundred years ago, the sea began to recede from this coastline and prosperity receded with it. Yet they still fish here and they still build boats to fish from. The kind of boats that haven't changed in a hundred years. The methods haven't changed much either and you walk ankle deep in the evidence. Now, how about that for a bit of stuff? The mark of the traditional worker in wood, in this case, wooden boats. And I'm sure that even Hugh Rossiter would agree that uh, there's nothing quite like wood when it comes to boats. Certainly that's the philosophy in this yard, where shavings like these have been falling to the floor for 150 years. We're at Rye in Sussex, where generations of the Phillips family have produced traditional clinker-built fishing boats, and they're still doing it. I think in this particular area, this particular boat has got a a need. Most of these boats are pulled out on the beach where fiberglass certainly doesn't uh, have a place at the moment anyway. Uh, they're very tough, they're easily repaired and they last an awful long time. What are you building these for then, these two? They're... These two small ones are purely for angling boats, that type of thing. Local fishermen? Local fishermen, yeah. Tell us a bit about the craft then, about the boat itself. Um, the whole boat Everything on the boat is a different shape. All the planks are different shapes and moulded as the boat is built. Yes. So no two things are the same, in fact. It's quite a long and uh, tedious process, if you like. I noticed that uh, as you're walking uh, uh, along the boat just now, you were marking it all up. Now, what's, what's happening here? Well, we're just about to put the ribs inside to steam the ribs, mm -hmm. and when we put the, them in, we need to know exactly where to place them. So we just put a chalk mark on to place the ribs. Did you put a uh, pencil line as well? Yes, we've got to drill holes the whole way around to drive the nails through. So we drill those from the inside before we put the ribs in to know where to put them. I see. And then you have to match up the, the rib to, uh, to the, the chalk. Yes, yeah. and all the chalk marks later on when it's varnished disappear. Oh, oh, uh, which is why they're done with chalk. Yes. Yeah. I, uh, I don't know anything about uh, building clinker boats, but um, I, I expected to see the ribs first. Uh, <laughs> backwards. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's the difference between clinker and carvel. Complete opposite, in fact, in that in carvel the framework is put up for a start and the planking is put to the framework. But in, in clinker, the hull is built and then the ribs and the reinforcing put in at a later date. Why is it that way round? Well, on the clinker built boats, every land is overlapped and then riveted together, which gives you quite a strong structure to start with and then obviously the ribs can be put in afterwards. Whereas on a carvel built boat, there's nothing holding the planks together edgeways. They're put onto the frames and then the joins are corked afterwards. 
Now, by land, I suppose you mean uh, the place where a plank actually meets another plank. That's it. The two planks are overlapped and the rivets put between. Mm -hmm. Now, I noticed that uh, there's no kind of caulking or filling or anything in between the two planks. Why doesn't a clinker-built boat leak? Um, well, it's just purely a matter of fitting one plank to the other, providing the planks are fitted properly, the water won't come through. The nails are called clenches, and they're made of copper, which is tolerant of salt water. And because copper is soft, they can be riveted over when they've finally been driven home. These are just being set in to receive the timbers. The timbers are oak. The steamer makes them supple for about three minutes, so you have to look lively. The timbers must be fitted with great accuracy and lined up along their length over the clench nails that have already been set in. The planking is mahogany. The oak timbers literally hold the sides of the boat apart and give the whole structure enormous strength. Fishing boats take a lot of punishment. Okay, Not every timber goes in sweetly. The Phillips Yard was founded in the 1870s and is strictly a family affair. Derek's grandfather took over from his father. His son, Harry, Derek's father, hasn't long retired from the changing world of building boats. Of course, everything's modern. You've got electric planers, electric saws, electric drills, everything. Whereas in the old days, uh, do everything by hand. Mm. And the first electric tool we had yeah. was an electric drill. Yeah. And I know my dad wouldn't have one of them for a start. And he says, all right, son, you, you do the electric drill and I'll do the hand drill, you know. <laughs> of course, I put about a dozen holes in, then he decided he'd have an electric drill. <laughs> That's what I meant to be that. Yeah, why wouldn't he have one? I suppose he... Well, he just thought it wouldn't work. Mm. See, it was a newfangled idea, as he thought. <laughs> so what's the state of the fishing industry now, then? Just at the moment, it's quite depressed, I suppose. Uh, over the last five years, the fishing has got worse, and the costs have risen dramatically, the overheads, and therefore the uh, new boat building suffers as a result. Is it fished out around here? I wouldn't say it's fished out, but it's very much uh, overfished, I would say, mm. over the years. So things are not looking good just the moment? No, no. I think it's mainly one of the major um, headaches is the rising cost of fuel and all these types of things, all the overheads, really. I suppose that was big business in those days, wasn't it? Oh, yes, and they were big boats, too. Wasn't many small boats. They were all large boats. What sort of size? You, you built those boats, did you? No, we never built the biggest ones. We built the beach boats and this, that and the other, which were quite large boats. But the large ones were built along the shipyard, just beyond us, about two or three hundred yards along there. What sort of size were the ones you were building then? Somewhere about 30 foot, 35 foot. Mm. And sometimes another thing we built was a few river barges for taking the gravel from here up to uh, Newenden and all them places. 
They were built of oak. Were they? Two inch oak. Difficult to get today, oak like that, isn't it? Yeah, and, and they were about oh, 50 foot long. I think they were 12 foot beam. All made of wood. When did you start in the business then? Well, I started round here with my dad. But uh, so you left school when you was 14 and you're supposed to give notice and orders, that and the other, but I didn't. Directly I reached 14, it was middle of the week. I come to my dad next day and said, I'm starting work. <laughs> as simple as that. Yeah, um, you know how much we got a week? No idea. One and six. One and six a week. A living wage at that time, wasn't it? Yeah, that's what we got for an apprentice. My goodness. Yeah. Do you think that a Phillips boat is as good today as it ever was? Oh, I think better, actually. More thought goes into them. In air day, everything was done by eye. You never had no plans or drawings. They told you what you wanted, and you used to build it. As simple as that. And I think the sun does today, a lot of them. You don't have moulds or plans for them. You just build them by eye. Derek, what's going to happen to your business? Because these old crafts are dying, aren't they? They are dying. We only cater for a very small area, just along the coast from Hastings down to Dungeness, really. And as the fishing gets worse, the orders tend to get less as well, unfortunately. How many of these boats do you build a year, then? Oh, if we build, the most we would build is probably three a year, I suppose, anyway. That's a reasonable order, is it? Oh, yes, yeah. yeah. A hundred years ago, they had centreboards and sails. As far as the boat is concerned, little else has changed. Uh -huh. In her little book, The Story of Two Ancient Towns, Ethel McGeorge says, the first and oldest of all rise industries is fishing. But though it still survives, it has to make a fight for life, and the glory of it has departed from rye. Gone are the days when great hauls of herring and mackerel were landed on the quays and hurried up to London with all speed. And she wrote that 50 years ago. fishing boat may perhaps be helped on her way with a can of beer or two. A sleek, sophisticated cruising yacht must be afforded the full ceremony. For Hugh Rossiter, this stylish 32-foot curlew is his latest pride and joy, and only well-tempered music and champagne will do. In the life story of any boat, 
there's really nothing quite to match the magic of the moment she first goes down the slip. I name this ship Curlew of Dorset. May God bless her and all who sail in her. The sense of occasion, even of mystery when a boat is launched, may well have been reflected even in pagan times with some casting of spells or other ritual. But the dressing overall, the bottle of champagne and the naming were brought to a fine art by those true masters of ceremony, the Victorians. It wasn't always champagne either. Many a bottle of sherry has gone down to the sea with ships. And something else has hit the water as well money. Not long ago, this curlew was merely a twinkle in the hopeful owner's bank account. Now all that's changed. They've weighed it in the balance, they've taken a deep breath, and they've spent the money. Yes, yes we have, but um, we feel that she's worth it. She's our home on the water, and um, we go where we want to travel quite a lot, and uh, we enjoy her. Yes, you have yes. actually sailed in a curlew before, of course, haven't yes, you? Yes, we have. We spent our holiday this year mm. and uh, we what? went to France and uh, sailed along the Normandy coast um, into the Seine as far as Enfleur. Oh, lovely. Yeah. And um, sailed about 400 miles. So you were hooked? Absolutely. Yeah, really? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did you sort of feel after all this time, planning, craftsmanship, thought, care, that you're, in a sense, losing a member of the family when you sell? Oh, yes, yes, but the owner never really takes complete ownership. <laughs> it's, all we, it's all we start our boats as well. <laughs> <laughs> That's really true, is it? I mean, yes, 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 yes. But um, what does the designer feel uh, when his creation, this new baby of his first hits the water apprehension whether we've got it right or not but um, I think we've got it right in this one ready about Leo I've got a run, running turn. And running. Ah. Right. That's it. Well done. Thank you. May have to do it again. No. Right. There goes the beer camp. Yeah, can I rescue that? The South Coast is well stocked with chaps building boats of all kinds for all purposes. Next week, we'll be having a look at some more variations on the theme. South Sport, we look at eating for health with dietitian Jane Griffin, take to the sky with a Dorset gliding.